Here's what to do if you're somehow stuck in North Korea. Number 11, Pyongyang Zoo. The Pyongyang Zoo is reportedly one of Kim Jong-un's favorite locations, and he's not afraid to show his support with some cash. Still, money alone doesn't cut it. The Pyongyang Zoo mostly relies on foreign help and expertise. Swedish zoo expert Jonas Wallström has been visiting Pyongyang Zoo regularly for the past 30 years and has even donated animals to the project. The zoo reopened in 2015 following a major refurbishment with one of the main attractions being a chimpanzee who smokes. Azalea, whose Korean name is Dali, is a 20-something years old female chimpanzee who took upon a bad habit, smoking. Zookeeper said that at one point she was going through a pack of cigarettes a day. Let's just say the Swedish zoo expert was uh, not thrilled to hear this. Other extraordinary animals at the Pyongyang Zoo are monkeys with remarkable basketball skills and a parrot who can recite poetry honoring the late state leader Kim Il-sung. The zoo features a swimming pool area that is home to several dolphins that perform tricks to the crowds. The zoo is also home to several breeds of dogs, something that you don't often get to see in a zoo. Various exhibits in the zoo have tributes to some of the world leaders who supplied the place with animals. Mao Zedong donated giant pandas to the zoo, while Ho Chi Minh supplied them with elephants. Robert Mugabe handed over a few rhinos, and Gaddafi sent over some camels. Mugabe was due to send another shipment of elephants, zebras, hyenas, and giraffes to the zoo in 2010, a shipment famously known as the Noah's Ark, with the North Korean state paying $900 for a giraffe and $600 for a zebra. However, due to international pressure, he was forced to pull out of the deal. Number 10, the DMZ. Barbed fences, tank traps, an active minefield. That's what you can expect to see on your visit to the DMZ. Soldiers stand guard on both sides, overseeing from outposts gazing across the border into forbidden lands, once unified in the eyes of the opponent's army. The peace treaty was never signed, the war between the North and South of Korea still rages on, at least technically anyway, and the demilitarized zone, the border between two countries now worlds apart, serves as the best reminder. One misstep could see you shot or carted away to a North Korean re-education camp. It seems dramatic, but that is the reality. There may not be bullets flying overhead or active servicemen crossing the border, but tensions are high. The DMZ splits the Korean Peninsula in half, creating a buffer zone between North Korea and South Korea. It's the most militarized border on Earth. Ever wonder what it's like to visit the DMZ? Spoiler alert, it's not exactly as terrifying as the media shows. You can visit DMZ both from North and South Korea. If you visit the DMZ from South Korea, a dress code applies. Don't point here, don't wave there, no laughing, serious face only. Don't provoke the North Koreans. They will shoot you at any moment. Please sign this waiver as you're heading into a volatile area. We can only stay for five minutes as it's too dangerous otherwise you may start a nuclear war. You better have your cameras ready but for the love of God please don't take photos of that. Taking photographs there breaches national security, you know? Meanwhile, on a trip from the North Korean side, there's no dress code. You have relative freedom to take whatever photos you like, go selfie crazy, even hell, take some photos with the military. That's in the zone though, not all around North Korea. Disperse from your group, your guides, and have a wander around. Wave, point, make hand signals, the lot, laugh even. Anything goes as long as you don't cross the line. It's great stuff. Fear-mongering stereotype reinforcement from the South, while on the North side, they're adamant in trolling you into a false sense of freedom and security. North Korea wants to appear level-headed to make you feel comfortable, to present their side of the story and specifically perpetuate the idea that they're being persecuted, that their free passage into the South is being restricted by South Korea and the Americans despite their best efforts at reunification. The DMZ to any of those visitors from the North is this evidence. And frankly, they do a good job. Indeed, it's peaceful, reasonable, and easygoing on the north side of the DMZ. As a result, it makes a mockery of the precautions taken by the south. At that moment, North Korea certainly doesn't appear to be the monster we're led to believe. However, you can't help but feel this is to be a calculated move, part of the Pyongyang propaganda machine made to twist your reality further. Of course, if there's one thing this country has mastered, it's how to fool your perception. Number nine, luxury ski resorts. What many don't know about the Swiss-educated North Korean leader is that he loves to ski. In fact, he loves it so much that he had his soldiers build a very expensive ski resort, Masik Rong. 
Masik Rong translates to mountain pass where horses rest. The luxury ski resort boasts 10 ski runs, one of which is a whopping 16,700 feet long. At the bottom of the hills, a huge electronic screen shows propaganda videos for all the skiers to enjoy. Near the resort stands an orange-colored 11-story hotel with 120 rooms, a karaoke bar, an indoor swimming pool, a gym, and a children's book room. You can buy North Korean purses in the store, and if you're a foreigner, you can use the internet room. Guest room TVs feature channels from the UK, Japan, Russia, China, and Germany, but North Korean locals are not permitted to watch them. It costs approximately $100 to ski for the day, and the resort only allows 2,000 guests daily. It takes about two hours to fly to North Korea's Kalma Airport, the closest to Masakrong from Beijing. Now, many have taken the trip, including Chinese diplomats, former Japanese pro wrestler Antonio Inoki, and former NBA player Dennis Rodman, who struck up an odd friendship with Kim Jong-un during his several trips to North Korea. United Nations sanctions will make it more difficult for Kim Jong-un to maintain his ski resort, though. He took advantage of a luxury good loophole in the UN Security Council resolution to import European manufactured snowmobiles and other ski equipment for his resort, but was not permitted to import a Swiss chairlift because of trade sanctions. Instead, Kim Jong-un had to make do with a 30-year-old Austrian ski lift which he bought from China. Looks like there will be trouble when he needs a new one. Kim Jong-un had another ski resort built and finished it in January 2018, Kangyi. The resort spans 12 acres and has a 1,739 main slope that both beginners and more experienced skiers can use. In addition, Kang Yi has a dedicated 656-foot beginner slope as well as accommodation and places to eat. Number 8. Kaesan Youth Park When the sun sets, most of the power-starved North Korean capitals plunged into darkness. The structures of Kaesan, however, are lit up like Times Square. Kaesan Youth Park is North Korea's Disneyland. It is one of three amusement parks serving Pyongyang, offering its citizens a rare dose of state-sanctioned fun. Just weeks before the North launched a saber-rattling attack on South Korea in 2010, theme park aficionado Stefan Zwangzer managed to ride the only roller coasters in North Korea. Like many outsiders visiting the country, he says much of what he saw was depressing. But the amusement parks were a different story. For just two dollars, you're in for hours of fun. On all ten of the rides, that is. They aren't much, but locals love them. A flying roller coaster imported from Italy opened in 2010, and as of 2013, the rides also include bumper cars, teacups, a swing ride, and a double shot like vertical drop. Considering the overall state of North Korea, the imported roller coaster is very likely one of the most cutting edge installations in the whole country. The ride is a belly down flying roller coaster that hurls passengers suspended in four man carriages around a bright orange track. There's another which straps passengers into a spinning wall of death carousel that swings up and down on a large semicircular track. Oh, and by the way, if you're a tourist, then get ready to be escorted throughout the whole visit at the park. Escorts won't leave your side, not even if you want to ride the roller coaster 10 times in a row. Number 7. The Hotel of Doom In 1987, ground was broken on a brand new hotel in Pyongyang. The pyramid-shaped supertail skyscraper was to exceed 1,000 feet in height and was designed to have at least 3,000 rooms, as well as five revolving restaurants with panoramic views. The Ryugyong Hotel, named after a historical moniker for Pyongyang meaning capital of willows, was supposed to open just two years later, but it never did. To this day, the 105-story Hotel of Doom has never hosted a single guest, but it remains a subject of international fascination and a pretty cool selfie background. Sometimes referred to as the 105 building, the building consists of three wings, each sloped at a 75 degree angle, merging into a cone encasing the top 15 floors, which are intended for restaurants and observation decks. The pyramidal shape is about more than aesthetics. It's because the Ryugyung, unusually for a skyscraper, is made of reinforced concrete rather than steel. The reason? North Koreans mostly know how to handle concrete, not steel. In 2008, glass and metal panels were installed to the concrete structure at the cost of $180 million, glazing it completely and giving the building a polished, sleek appearance. German luxury hotel group Kempinski announced that the Ryugyung would partially open under its management in mid-2013, but pulled out a few months later. Meanwhile, North Korea has found other ways to use the building. Propaganda. In 2018, lighting designer Kim Young Il created a light show composed of political slogans and party symbols. It plays on the building's surface for several hours every night. That is, on the nights when there are no electricity shortages. 
Number 6. High-End Shopping Malls Shops in North Korea offer the most bizarre and exotic shopping experience you'll ever have. North Korea has a number of gift shops set up only for tourists that sell a range of local but eccentric goods. A few of these shops are situated in the Yangagato Hotel, but there are others around popular tourist sites and museums. Unlike in some Asian countries, the staff in North Korea is very reserved. They're never pushy and they won't try to rip you off. There aren't exactly dozens of brands as what we're used to seeing in department stores, but the offering is pretty unique. From local foods to souvenirs and books about North Korean propaganda. In 2019, North Korea has opened a new high-end department store in Pyongyang that offered luxury Western goods. Shops at the Daesung department store can be seen displaying products from brands such as Chanel, Rolex, and Nike. If the items are real, they're actually illegal. UN sanctions have been in place since 2006, which banned the sale of all luxury goods to North Korea. North Korea is known to use secretive trading routes to get banned items. However, the North's largest trading partner is China, which is well known for producing high quality fakes, so who knows? Whether the goods are genuine or not, the images prove that there is a demand among North Koreans elite for Western luxuries. That's an idea that runs counter to the country's ideology of nationalism and militant self-reliance. Kim himself is well known for his taste in the finer things, such as cheese and expensive alcohols. Visitors to North Korea lately say they're seeing more locally made products, from carrot-flavored toothpaste and charcoal face masks to motorcycles and solar panels in the isolated country shops and supermarkets. North Koreans increasingly don't want Chinese products because they think they are of poor quality. Locally made consumer goods are apparently becoming increasingly sophisticated. Market vendors are also becoming more competitive, offering food samples to shoppers, something they didn't do as little as five years ago. Number 5. Pyongyang Metro The Pyongyang Metro is one of the main transit systems in the North Korean capital Pyongyang. It consists of two lines. The Chalima Line, which runs north from Pyuhong Station on the banks of the Taedong River to Purungubyeol Station, and the Hyaksin Line, which runs from Hwangbok Station in the southwest to Ragwon Station in the northeast. The two lines intersect at Chanu Station. Structural engineering of the metro was completed by North Korea with rolling stock and related electronic equipment imported from China. This was later replaced with rolling stock acquired from Germany. There are all manner of conspiracy theories about the Pyongyang metro. That there are, in reality, only two stations, that it only works when tourists are there, that all the locals there are actors. Despite the claims, the Pyongyang Metro is indeed a functional system running along two bisecting lines in the central and outer western parts of Pyongyang. The metro is cheap. 5-1 a ride, which is pocket change even for the poorer of Pyongyang's residents, but limited. In the heavily residential area east of the Taedong River, there are no stations. It may not cover as many places as the tram and trolleybus network, but if you need to go anywhere near a station, then chances are you'll use it. It's estimated that around 300,000 to 700,000 people use the metro daily. Pyongyang is plagued by power shortages, but they are not common on the metro. Tourists sometimes experience them, not on the trains, but on the escalators. Number 4. The Arch of Triumph At 197 feet high and 164 feet wide, the Arch of Triumph in Pyongyang is the second tallest arch in the world. The tallest is the Monumento a la Revolution in Mexico City. It's also 33 feet taller than the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, which it was obviously modeled after. The Arch of Triumph was officially opened in April 1982 to mark the 70th birthday of Kim Il-sung, the first leader of North Korea. It was President Kim Il-sung who, according to North Korean history, led the Korean resistance to Japan from 1925 to 1945, although he was only 13 in 1925. The Arch is steeped in symbolism with references to the anti-Japanese revolutionary struggle, the Korean nation, and of course, Kim Il-sung. The structure is apparently made from 25,500 blocks of white granite, each one representing a day in the life of President Kim Il-sung up to his 70th birthday. On either side of the arch are the dates 1925 and 1945, referring to the period during which Kim spent in resistance to the Japanese. 
Also inscribed on the arch are the words of the revolutionary hymn Song of General Kim Il-sung and 70 azalea reliefs representing each year of Kim's life. Bronze statues on the arch pay homage to the three pillars of the Workers' Party of Korea, showing workers, farmers, and the intelligentsia, and the soldiers who fought for the Korean Revolutionary Army. Also represented is Mount Paektu, a sacred mountain that played a part in the fight against Japanese occupation as it's believed that Kim Il-sung organized his resistance in the dense forest surrounding the mountain. Inside the Arch of Triumph, meanwhile, are a series of viewing platforms and rooms connected by elevators and stairs. From the top, visitors have impressive views across the surrounding neighborhood, Kim Il-sung Stadium, and Morinbong Park. Number 3. Mansu Hill Grand Monument On Mansu Hill in Pyongyang, you can see the 65 feet high bronze statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. To North Koreans, this place is sacred and it allows the great leaders to be remembered forever. You can tell that, by the rules, it's almost as if visiting a religious object. All visitors to the site, both locals and foreigners, are expected to be respectful, bow, and leave flowers. Photos of the statues are permitted, but the photos must capture the statues in their entirety. Kim Il-sung, the one with his arm outstretched, was the original monument unveiled in 1972 to celebrate the leader's 60th birthday. Reportedly, the statue was originally covered in gold, but was changed to the less expensive bronze at the insistence of China. After his death, the leader's son, Kim Jong-il, joined him in bronze. Behind the statues is a mosaic figure of Paekdu Mountain, known as the birthplace of the Korean people. On either side of the two great leaders, there are enormous stones with KWP flags and 228 bronze figures all standing at 16 feet high. Number 2. Jush Tower Jush Tower is a stone column tower which celebrates, as the name denotes, the Jush ideology of North Korea. The ideology refers to the independence and self-reliance of the nation, necessitating that it must act on its own to secure its destiny and resist outside domination. The tower first opened in 1982 and bears a striking resemblance to the Washington Memorial. The North Korean version is slightly taller and has a flaming torch at the top. To each side of the tower, there are apartment blocks, and on top of the building, a Korean slogan reads, Il Sim Dan Kyol, with one heart, unite. A visit to the Jewish Tower begins by meeting the tower guide, who has specialized knowledge in the ideology. The guide will briefly explain the Jewish ideology and why the tower was built. It's only then that you can go inside. In the entrance hall, there are 80 stone plaques that supposedly represent the support for the Jewish ideology by other socialist and communist parties around the world. The main circular room has a small bar and a cafe, along with a little shop that sells books on, you've guessed it, Jewish ideology. If you ever happen to go here, you'll be expected to buy something before heading to the top. Visitors can take the elevator to the top, and the trip up costs around $6 to $7. At the top, there's a panoramic view of all Pyongyang and the Taedong Riverside. Across the river, you can see Kim Il-sung Square and the Grand People's Study House. Tipping Customs What about tipping in North Korea? While it's not mandatory, tipping definitely can help your trip go a bit smoother. You can tip on several different occasions. First, you can tip the so-called minders, the mandatory escort guides that are going to follow you everywhere on your trip to North Korea. Tipping them anywhere from $15 to $20 is considered decent, and it'll ensure you get the best guides. In North Korea, most of what you eat and drink is going to be part of your tour package, so the wait staff won't expect any additional tips on top of it. But it's nice if you're able to leave them a little something behind and help them and their families. Let's say you can round up your bill in the end or order an extra plate of something you enjoyed. Gift giving is also a pretty big deal in North Korea, even more than tipping. Some tour providers even recommend you bring gifts to the local guides as a sign of gratitude and respect. No clue what to get them? Well, skip the Western magazines, books, and media, and anything else that may get them in trouble. Instead, focus on something they don't have access to. Let's say a box of chocolate, a pack of cigarettes, beauty products, and even a bottle of your favorite whiskey are all acceptable. You can also think outside the box. Get the guide some painkillers, flu medicine, vitamins, repair kits, razors, electronic toothbrushes, and so on. Basically, anything that may be helpful, but they can't find it over there. Number 1. Pyongyang Water Park A water park in North Korea? Yep, there's one, although only a handful of people get to visit. The Munsu Water Park has all sorts of indoor and outdoor pools. They have wave machines, lazy rivers, a range of slides, and a two-story gym. Only the North Korean elite have the privilege of enjoying this stuff. Kim Jong-un ordered construction of the 37-acre park. 
He had it built right in the heart of the capital, Pyongyang. North Korean propaganda claims that they built the park to, um, quote, to make sure that the people enjoy all the benefits of socialist civilization to their heart's content. With that in mind, it's no surprise this is a rule. Before visitors can take a dip in the pools, they first have to bow to a statue of Kim Jong-un's dad, Kim Jong-il, at the park's entrance. Most of the people visiting are almost only North Koreans of all ages, but of one social class. The reported cost of a four-hour visit to the park is around $8. The average North Korean income is roughly $30 a week, so it isn't cheap for them. North Korea claims the park welcomed 880,000 visitors in its first year in 2016, but recent reports suggest the park had only 100,000 visits in the first half of 2016. Tourists say that the park is one of the best places for visitors to talk to locals. Here's what's next. 